The cost of living crisis is the central issue facing most Britons right now. Energy bills are rocketing, food prices are rising and wages and benefits are not catching up. And it's in this context that top Tories are sounding ever more out of touch. Watch how Boris Johnson responds to this question on Good Morning Britain. We get emails all the time, Prime Minister, about this. You have said that individuals have to make choices about what they spend their money on. You've, you're on record as saying that, OK? And I want to ask you then about a number of our viewers who have got in touch with us about the choices that they're making. Elsie is 77. She's a widow and she's a pensioner who lives in a council house. She receives a pension of £170 a week. Her energy bills have gone, get this, from £17 a month to £85 a month. Yeah. She will pay an additional £816 a year. To cut down on spending, Prime Minister, Elsie has now resorted to eating one meal a day. She's 77 years old. She's losing weight. She goes to the supermarket at the end of the day to buy yellow sticker discounted items. She gets up early in the morning to use her Freedom Bus Pass to stay on buses all day to avoid using energy at home. What else should Elsie cut back on? In your well, opinion? I don't want Elsie to cut back on anything. Let's talk about, about Elsie and what we're, uh, what we're, what we're doing. And I just remind you that the, uh, the 24 hour Freedom Bus Pass was something that I actually introduced just so Elsie should but, be grateful but, but, to you no, for her bus no, pass. But... So that was Boris Johnson's response to a 77-year-old woman who stays on the bus all day because she can't afford to heat her homes. You should be grateful for your bus pass. I brought in her freedom pass, so now she can pass the days in the warmth of a bus. How wonderful of me. Now 77-year-olds can hang around on buses instead of in their homes, which are freezing because energy is, is so expensive and I haven't raised their pensions or benefits by a large enough amount. Concessionary bus travel for pensioners was actually introduced in 1973, not by Boris Johnson, but by the Greater London Council, which is a governing body that was abolished by Thatcher for being too left wing. Just a little corrective history there, because I think it's really important that we don't let the Tories get away with claiming credit for things that we now enjoy and now have that they actually at the time fought tooth and nail against. What this clip really brings home to me, and I've said this a couple of times before, is that Boris Johnson is not this savvy media player or media communicator that he's often portrayed to be. His, his political rise has not been the result of some kind of innate intelligence or skill. And you can see in that clip, he's just a well-networked, posh boy who had vast swathes of institutional connection and support, which has helped essentially to conceal his cruelty and lack of competence from the general public. It just goes to show, I think, how success in this domain is really in part manufactured and decided by the extent to which your mistakes and your scandals are hyped up and, and embedded in the public consciousness by the media and how much the media is actually complicit in other instances of, of covering up for your scandals, as we've seen uh, throughout the career of Boris Johnson. I absolutely agree. If he was put under the same scrutiny that Jeremy Corbyn had been, his career would have been over, as you say, in 20 minutes. But that was an effective interview, I think, from Susanna Reid there, potentially why Boris Johnson had refused to go on Good Morning Britain for the past five years. And the reason it was effective is because she put those human experiences to him. His fatal flaw isn't really that he lies, I think, or, or, or you know, or that he breaks rules. So he has no compassion for people. He just does not care about ordinary working class people. He couldn't care less. It, it was so obvious in that clip that he was in no way moved by that very, I mean, tragic story really that, that was told to him. Someone who spends all day on a bus because they can't heat their house. This is someone who is 77. Someone who is 77 eats one meal a day. He's told all of that. He looks a little bit irritated and said, well, it was me who introduced the bus pass. Now I think that the specifics of this is you're absolutely right, Dahlia. The, the, the Freedom Pass was introduced in 1973. I think Boris Johnson's defence is he introduced the 24-hour Freedom Pass when he was London mayor, which I suppose means that now if you can't afford 
to live in a house, you should be grateful to Boris Johnson because now you can ride the buses 24 hours a day to try and keep warm in case you can't afford to, to heat your own flat. We've got one more out of touch Tory for you now. This was George Eustace on Sky News. So what's your advice to people then who want a Sunday roast with a chicken for the family, but they can't afford it? Well, the, um, the, the thing to bear in mind is that if you look at household spending uh, on food in the UK, it's actually, you know, the lowest in Europe, partly because we've got uh, that very competitive market. Uh, it used to be for the poorest 20% of households, about 16% of their income used to go on food. That dropped a few years ago to about 14%. It's going to rise again now, but generally speaking, you know, what people find is that by going for some of the sort of value brands rather than... Uh, uh, you know, own branded uh, products, they can actually sort of contain and, and manage their household budget. So that was the Environment Secretary arguing that if poor people are struggling with the increasing cost of living, they should switch to buying value goods. Now, value goods have, have existed for a while on supermarket shelves. So I think someone needs to ask that guy, who was buying these in the first place? What was the demand for these value goods? It wasn't from George Eustace and his mates who are really, really smart with money, so they know how to get the right deals. No, it was poor people who were already buying the value goods. You can't tell people who are already buying value goods, oh, well, if, you, if you're struggling with the cost of living, switch to what you're already buying. You know, if that's his advice, the only implication is that he's happy for people to go hungry. They should buy less of the cheaper goods they were already buying. Dali, what's your response to George Eustace? And I suppose, you know, just the general attitude that the Tories are displaying on this question of the cost of living. It's an attitude as old as neoliberalism itself, arguably of, of capitalism itself. What, what George Eustace is engaging in here is the tried and tested neoliberal strategy of framing systemic issues as matters of personal failing. You don't have intergenerational wealth. Well, it's your parents' fault for not working hard enough. Or you can't save money because landlords have been allowed to charge half your income in rent. Well, it's your fault for eating too many avocado toasts. Or you grew up in a school with no funding. Well, you didn't pull your bootstraps hard enough. You didn't revise your exams hard enough. You work three jobs, but because the minimum wage hasn't risen in line with inflation, you still have barely any savings in your bank account. Well, that sounds like a you problem. You didn't, uh, you didn't manage your money enough. You didn't meal prep enough. So we have very deliberate sets of policies that not only restrict the ability of people to decide their own lives, but that actively redistribute wealth and take wealth from working people in this country to the very rich. And then those working class people are then sold moralizing narratives that encourage them to either blame themselves or, as is often the case, blame those who are more worse off than they are for their own exploitation. What really frustrates and enrages me, and it's something that I don't know how they've gotten away with for so long, is that these narratives of personal responsibility and rugged individualism are being crafted and sold to us by people whose success is entirely predicated upon other people. Their wealth is entirely created by other people, whether it's the workers that they exploit to make their money or the nannies and domestic workers that do all of their domestic work at home. People who, who as we've seen throughout this entire party gate scenario, have never taken personal responsibility for anything. They don't even know how to do it. It's distasteful and shocking to see it in this particular instance because of the fact that the cost of living crisis is on the front page of every news and the fact that I think increasingly in this situation, which we didn't see under austerity, we are seeing the media being more willing to point the finger at policymakers rather than going along with the narrative that this is inevitable, that you know we need to balance the budget, et cetera. So whilst we're seeing it in quite sharp relief in that interview, particularly when it's juxtaposed by the story of Elsie that we heard earlier on in the segment, this is the fundamental logic upon which our economic system is based. It's the fundamental narrative under which our economic system runs. It's a way of selling neoliberalism as a false meritocracy, where the myth is that you get back what you put in. But obviously, we know that it's the people who put in the most in terms of their labor, in terms of their time, in terms of their effort. Often those are the people that are getting the crumbs. They are getting the very least out of that economic system. So 
it's put on perfect display by George Eustace there, but it's not a logic, it's not a narrative that was invented by George Eustace. It's actually pretty much the normative logic um, that has been embedded in our culture for the past 20 to 30 years. 